So now I'm going to move to projects that, um, so I think the first project started out in sort of public space. The second ones were working kind of within art institutions. And now I'm going to show projects that are institutions themselves. So the, the artwork is an institution as a form. Uh, so the first one was a very brief project, but a kind of an experiment. So I lived in uh, Oakland, which is across from San Francisco. Um, excuse me. It's choking me. And, uh, and so I... Actually, this is still within an institution. So I showed at an art gallery that was across the street from a very busy uh, French-Vietnamese restaurant. And uh, you can see when you're sitting in the gallery, uh, you can look through the windows and you see the restaurant across the street. So this is the restaurant, Le Cheval, which to me was always a very strange name because the horse for a restaurant, I don't know if I want, uh, you know, you imagine they might serve you horse. Um, so I opened a, a, my own restaurant across the street in the gallery and I called it the horse in English. I um, rented tables. I printed menus, and the menus had the same items that you could get across the street with the same prices. Um, you would come in, and you would order the food, and then we would call across the street for takeout. <laughs> yeah. And then I, at the time, would dress up in, in a... Yeah, there's a big horse. Uh, so I had a tracksuit on and um and throughout the night i would run back and forth with the food from one restaurant to my restaurant um and we would take it the chefs would take it out of the boxes and put it onto plates and uh and voila we have a i now have a restaurant so the the idea for me here was like and this is very we've had this discussion about uh you know italy is a very top down structure institutions government control so much for me i mean that happens everywhere obviously in different ways for me i wanted i wanted a restaurant but i'm just an individual i don't have any money i don't have any expertise <laughs> i don't have a staff but could i take um the stream of culture and commerce and dig out like you know imagine a river and you dig out a little part of the river and make that make a little stream that goes into your own pond. <laughs> That's how I thought it. My pond was my restaurant that ran off of the other restaurant. Now the the first restaurant got all the money, so it's good for them. It doesn't. Um, it's like uh, you know a parasite, but sometimes a parasite destroys the host. It you know, like a virus would destroy what it has. This is like a, you know, on, like say on whales, they have those fish, the sucker fish that clean the whales. They're like parasites, but they actually help the host as well. It's the idea of like two systems that can actually work together. But the first system didn't ask for the second system <laughs> necessarily. Um, so for me, this was an experiment in autonomy and power. You know, can I create power off of someone else's power? Um, this is another project again in the city that I live in Pittsburgh um, it's in an area that a neighborhood that was decimated everyone left uh, the economy collapsed and a shopping mall went up and all the businesses moved to the shopping mall it happens in lots of places so uh, this building used to be a radio station in the 1940s and um, there it was a radio station that played uh, black music by black artists so one of the things in America is that white culture always adopts black culture right so Elvis Presley just took black culture sold it to white people made a lot of money from it um, but one of the things this radio station did was it played the original music which is rare and it was also a time when radio was a place where you could make a discovery you know, you weren't, I mean, music now is everywhere. We get it online. Then it was like the radio. Um, so the station has since closed from the city that doesn't exist anymore. So what we did is um, 
we opened another radio station. It's just a pirate transmitter, right? Pirate radio transmission in an empty building. We the landlord agreed to let us paint a sign on the side of the building. So 102.9 is the radio signal. And um and all the only thing that the radio station plays is a recording of an extinct bird. So it's a field recording of the last bird of its species before it died. So y it's just so you'll be on the radio dial and you see, you know, and then you'll turn to this and it'll be like <laughs> and it's almost like silence. <laughs> but no, it was a real bird. It was a real the recording, yeah. It was a real recording. We just played it on a loop. And the idea is that you're listening to the sound of extinction, you know. In some ways, it becomes a metaphor for the loss of the neighborhood and the community gone away that doesn't exist there, or the radio station doesn't exist anymore. So, like, how do you, what is the sound of something that no longer exists? You know, so what's that echo? Um, so, I, I mean, I think of this as an institution. I mean, it's a project that presents itself as if it's a radio station but it's trying to also talk about a social condition that's very particular. Um, and frankly, all it takes is one little pirate transmit. Now we got the federal government found out about this because there's very strict rules. I mean, I know in Bologna they have all this alternative radio, but we have very strict rules about you can't do this. So after two months, it got shut down. Um, this I won't go into great detail, but this is a very complicated project. In 2005, I created an, what was called the Independent School of Art. So uh, as someone who teaches and someone who makes art, uh, it started off by the fact that I we had we talked about before that everything could be a material. Well, how come so much art looks the same? And um, and does an institution, we talk about art school, is an institution the best model for where you should learn art? Or does it create institutionalized artist? Um, so for me, the idea of you want to train an artist to be a citizen of the world, to create their own identity in how they define it. So the Independent School of Art had no buildings, no accreditation, you didn't get a degree, no money <laughs> it was complete if you t i basically took away everything that art school should be and it was just a group of people it was always me and a group of students who would change from semester to semester and if we didn't show up like if you didn't show up today we don't exist so it barely exists it only exists because there's a social architecture not because there's a physical architecture or an economic so the way it works is the first challenge is we have to figure out where to meet every day. So the city of San Francisco becomes uh, uh, like resourcing a city as a pedagogical tool. How do you exist? How do you make a living? Where do you find places? How do you create community? Um, if we wanted to watch video, we went to a, a local Thai restaurant and asked them if we could use their video that they serve soap operas on for the students to show their artwork. Uh, we would use other art galleries. Again, it's the parasitic model because no one goes to art galleries. <laughs> they're usually empty. Yeah, so they're great for having classrooms in. <laughs> yeah, they're wonderful spaces, right? And we're bringing artists to the art gallery. So so that worked very well. Um, so we would come in and we'd look at the work and then I'd say, is it okay if we sit here for an hour <laughs> and just have a discussion about s one of the students' work? Yeah, just randomly. Yeah, and uh, they were just happy to have people in there, right? Um, parks, etc. So there were. A, it's a very complicated project. It went on for several years, but one of the things that we did was we would always think about what do we produce and how is what we produce related to what happens in the larger culture. Usually in art school, it's the classroom. It's a very in, uh, incestuous an insular system, right? Small, we sit there, we look at your painting, we put it up, we talk. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful. People will love it. Blah, blah, blah. You go home, you put it in your bag, you throw it away. 
It has nothing to do with life. So everything we produced had to have a kind of public quality to it, involve the public. So uh, one of the things that happens as an artist, and you tell me if they do this at your academy, to learn how to paint, you copy the masters. Huh? Is that something you do? You know, you go to a museum, you cut or Van Gogh or whatever, you copy, which is fine. It's you know, that's I learned that way too. So uh we were interested in okay, so you make these copies as a way of learning technique, as a way of having the mind of that artist. I mean I think it's very valuable. Um but what about what happens to that artwork in the world? Right? So many of those masterworks are traded on the art market. They're put up for auction and they have an economic life as well as a life of their concept. So what we did is we made a black market auction in which every student in my school made a, a knockoff of a famous artwork, kind of like people make knockoffs of Louis Vuitton bags. So, and then we invited 80 other artists from across the United States to make knockoffs of famous artworks. The other, the first idea was um, we're going to hold an auction of all these works, and um, we're going to make them available cheap to artists who could never have an artwork because I can't afford a Damien Hirst. Not that I want one, but um, or any other artworks, right? So we love art. How come we can't have it in our homes? That's the first idea. The second idea is to put these into the art market as forgeries uh, so that they destabilize the works that are already there. And the third idea is we make money parasitically off of people's love of these works. So people like Damien Hirst will sell the Damien Hirst. Um, so we, we ended up making $13,000 from... Uh, I don't know what that is in euros, but maybe 13,000. So it's about 9,000 euros, 10,000 euros. Yeah. Um, so for a school that has no money, the question who wants to do things with money, the question is, do we write grants? Do we go to other institutions and ask them for money? Or do we just make money off of the art market that's already there? And so the artists who produce the works got half of that money. And then we, as a school, got the rest to do additional projects. So the economy of our existence was part of the pedagogy, right? Usually you pay a tuition to go to art school. Pff, who knows where it goes? I don't know how it gets. And you don't feel like that tuition and the person who is working, maybe the, the teacher, there's a separation, you know. You also don't feel like if, if you, it's back to what is your responsibility when you go to a museum for the painting? If you didn't show up, would it still be there? The same thing with art school. What's your responsibility? If you don't participate in art school or class, is it education? So that was the basic structure of the project. We also, the way in which I was paid and anyone who came and worked with us was through barter, through trade of services. So the students did babysitting, website development, uh, cooking, um, stuff like that let's see I'm gonna go by this okay okay so this is a this will get to this conflict kitchen project um, but before that there was a, a this is again in the city I live in so I make a lot of work in other cities but I always make work in the city I live in because I'm there every day it's part of my life I want the work I make to kind of inform my life and I want my life to inform the work I make. And I th I know that there's artists who travel around the world, they go to biennales and they make work, but which is fine, but oftentimes then you, you, it's never as satisfying to me. I mean, I love doing the project with the pigeons in, the, in China. Never as f satisfying to me as the work I make in the city I live, because I feel like I'm creating the culture I live in. And this is, a to me, a, maybe a very important thing that we talk about with in relation to Tabari. Um, so this is in Pittsburgh. This is a African American neighborhood, working class. Pittsburgh has a lot of neighborhoods where people have left the buildings. You know, they're vacant. 
So I took over this building with a class that I teach. So I was teaching a class in vacant storefronts and we would have to create culture in that storefront. So this started that way. So um, the storefront was right next to a nightclub, a, a hip hop nightclub. And so hip hop functions, or it brings people together. It brings class and race together. Um, and so what we did is we opened something called the waffle shop. Waffle? The food. Yeah. Uh, voila. <laughs> and um, so it was a restaurant that started off open on Friday and Saturday nights from 11 p.m. until 3 in the morning when people were at the nightclub next door. So like parasitically, they're drinking and they're partying and we have carbs and sugar and we bring these people in to our restaurant. And the way the restaurant functions, though, is um, in the back of the restaurant is a talk show set. See? So any customer is invited to be on the talk show. And then we stream it live on the Internet. And the public on the Internet can actually interact with us through like a live chat. So anyone could watch it like this is being live streamed and people are watching it, but I don't think they can chat. Um, so it's the local audience like us. We're at the restaurant. Um, so anyone who walks in, you order food and we say, oh, would you like to come up and be on the talk show? And what happens is you get people who would never talk to each other all of a sudden getting onto this talk show. And although none of us have ever, I mean, I've never been on a real talk show. We kind of know how to behave. We know like the host asks the questions, the guest talks about their life. Um, so it's very natural performance. And it's a good situation in which people who do not consider themselves artists or performers can feel comfortable to participate. So this project uh, lasted for four years in the city. Uh, we ended up opening, yeah, in Saturday and Sunday for brunch as well. Um, this is say this boy this um this man on the right is a kid who lives in our neighborhood and he hosted a show so he would the host a show just means you show up <laughs> and you stand behind the desk uh and this woman who um is a jewish woman from a, a kind of wealthy neighborhood nearby came in on her birthday uh you see her glasses have candles birthday candles on the top <laughs> So she came in because there's a waffle shop and she could have her birthday with her friends in the waffle shop. She did not know there was a talk show because <laughs> there's always a talk show. And she's like, oh, I'll get up on this talk show. It would be fun. And so she ends up talking to this, this kid who he wants to talk about Islam and basketball. And she's great. She's very funny. And they talk about Islam and they talk about basketball. So she's having a conversation with a kid she would never talk to. Uh, not because she's racist or anything, but just because in her life she doesn't come across, you know, they don't hang out. So this becomes, for me, like a um, a documentary without a beginning or end. It's constantly presenting this, the identities, thoughts, behaviors of people in our community. Um, so here you can see we, ha we have two cameras always, and we do just an edit, kind of like they're doing here stream it live um ah yeah Let's see so the whole pro so when you walk in right so it's sustainable because when you walk in you're an audience member by default because it's going on you can ignore it you can choose to just eat and talk um but you're an audience member you're a funder if you buy the food you're funding the creative production and then you're the producer so potentially you make the content as well so you wear three different hats so yeah so it allowed us to to keep it alive um people then wanted to do their own shows but anything that anyone wanted to do they had to be able to anyone who walked in the door could be on the show that was the only rule uh and the other rule was we kept we would say to anyone uh, the first rule is anyone who walks in the door can be on your show. The second rule is that failure is the norm. That's what we use the term. I don't know if that translates. Failure is the norm. Like we expect failure. Uh, yeah. 
because people would be nervous and we'd be like, no, 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 we want you to fail. <laughs> it's okay, everyone fails. <laughs> so this project we figured about 10,000 people in four years were performed on stage in one way. I'm gonna show. Yeah, yeah, not as many as we had live, but yeah, we would have people from all over the world who would type in, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so we would have, com this host would talk to someone in anywhere. Like you could watch when it was live, you know? And it was live every weekend for 10 hours a day. Um, in Bari, definitely. <laughs> definitely yeah definitely in bari i know i love this project this is one of my favorite projects um so see i think what if i did it again i would put it into a pre-existing restaurant rather than me creating the restaurant <laughs> Because I had to run, we had to run the kitchen, the food, the waiters, the blah. It's just, it was. Uh, <laughs> well, I, so, okay. So, one of the things, and this is important. So, one of the reasons I could do this was it's very inexpensive in Pittsburgh. To rent the space was $500 a month only. Ah, yeah. So, the second is as a professor at the local university, I rented the space as a classroom. So I found a loophole. So it was free. So that's free. Yeah, <laughs> now I am. So the next thing. Uh, students uh, at my university, are they receive uh, scholarships to work in the community. So I had this considered as a scholarship. The scholarship is supported by the government, the United States government. So the government was paying students to work in my operation. And this... So... In four years, we hired over 350 students at my university. We became the largest employer for students at the university. <laughs> and then I hired people from the city as well, you know, to be managers and producers. So a student could, be, could make money to be a talk show host or to be a video producer or to be a cook. Mm. Why it stopped? So after four years, I started to get bored. And in the beginning, I think it was very unusual uh, for people would come. They, you know, they're like, "There's a waffle shop." It's like the rumor. Like, there's a waffle shop that has a talk show. Really, that to me, that space is very important to maintain. And when it just becomes like, "Oh yeah, there, you, you're going to go to the waffle shop talk show," um, eh, it's not so interesting. So for me, that's. That's why it stopped. Um, and to be honest, working with students is very limiting because they've got other things in their life and you can only achieve a certain type of professionalism. Um, so I'll show a short video. Do you want to see? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's one of my favorite things. So I'm going to... Maybe we can... Uh, I'll turn off the lights. Okay. No? Ah, okay. Ah, media not found. No, wait. Ah, tick the ball. No, it's. Uh, hold on one second. It's not finding the media file. So, what was a pilot? Local host. I was, uh, I was okay. I I was, uh, I was the lion in the Wizard of Oz. In jail. In prison. I can't. I don't do anything. Goes. I can. I. I can do some stuff. I can be the lion from the Wizard of Oz in prison.
Yeah. When the first time I saw a light switch turn on. You just thought it was like daytime all of a sudden. I was like, yeah, I was like, what madness is this? That's yeah. why I used to talk like that. I don't talk like that much anymore. Right. But what, I, I, what madness ye lore hath brought before the, thine eyes. <laughs> and then I just smash it into bed. <laughs> ridiculous thing i mean like i saw inception last week and this is weirder really oh well, yeah oh, wow. like i feel like i'm in an inception right now you know what i have to say ellen that. page built this world for me yeah. i can't believe this exists to be honest I, yeah, many people can't believe that it exists it's odd though that you can't believe that it exists and you're actually physically here. I, this was on our bucket list. Yes. You yeah, because we've list. always waffle drove past shop. this yeah, waffle yeah, yeah, place yeah. and we're like, what is this waffle shop and why is it only open in the middle of the night? So. <laughs> it's very cool. Christine and I don't know each other a- at all. We, we met this morning. Just this morning yeah. over waffles and coffee. Uh-huh. Um, but, a, but now we're, now this is amazing. It's definitely a nerd tree. Someone to understand you <laughs> like I do. It's a chill wheel waffle show with yeah, Matt let's Sandler go. and this with Matt chill Sandler. Wheel. This is my new friend Matt this is my Sandler. New friend, chill wheel. Oh, wait, what so do you do you keep your raps clean? Uh no, because this is my life. This is what I do every day. So I agree with that. I mean I can't. You know, Rapping is life, and life isn't always clean. I can't bleep out my life. <laughs> I can't, it is what it is. I've tried bleeping out my life. It's not fun. People get annoyed. Exactly. What qualifies you to do this? Uh, knowing the right people. Oh, you know these people that end this? Sort of. And being at the right place at the wrong time. So they get a different time. host every night? Yeah, I'm sorry, my wife's calling me. Hang on, I gotta talk to her. Alright, no, that's fine. Go ahead. Hey, honey. Y'all go. You're on... You're, you're on I'm talking to you on, on the show. So tonight, we're going to be talking about theories that conspiracize theories, theories, also known as conspiracy theories. Think about where the word co comes from. Co. Co, C-O. And it can't stand alone. What do you need? You need a hyphen. Now think about what's a hyphen. A hyphen is a minus sign. So minus. you're already not working together. So I don't even see how you co anything, really. You subtract. Subtracting. Taken away from the really basic saying, element. Really, you're saying, Cole, fuck you. I'm doing this on my own. That's symbolic right there. Right there. That's what, you what got is that talking about? on a cupcake. Now you got white break frosting. That down. Break it down. You got white frosting on what? On a black chocolate cupcake. cupcake. Now what's in between the black chocolate cupcake there and his go. ham? Exactly. Uh huh. The white woman. The white. Always queen. in between. The black cupcake and his ham and his ham. It was a musical theater prison. It was a prison for people who were involved in musical theater who went astray. <laughs> you look stunned. You know, we're not, we weren't that organized. Um, we never really finished a show. We'd really? get a few acts, you know, a few scenes into it. Yeah. And things would go south. Right. I think I have pretty eyes. I don't think people look at each other's eyes enough. I think people should, like, really look in their eyes. And not look in their eyes in a cliche way of, like, looking them in the eyes when they're saying something. Like, really look at all the, the little details and crap in your eyes. You have an eye freckle. I know, it's right here, right? Yeah, it's more of like an eye pimple. I heard that your mother is African American. Um, I feel like we all come from Africa, really. But um, I'll leave it at that. I think we're all African American. Yeah, now how was that growing up? Being black. Being black? Being black in a white face was was traumatic, I think. I, I think. The hardest thing was when my school friends, my chums at school. Chums. Chums, yes, because I was raised white, you know. Right, oh, so like chums was the word. When I had my, my chums. Chums is the word. My chums at school uh, would, would constantly make, make these, these, uh, these off-color jokes, these references. 
Don't spit on my waffles. I'm sorry. These, these references. That was good. Okay, good. I might need new waffles, dude. He totally spit on them. Okay. Uh, these, these references to uh, to uh, people of color as, as as being less than them, or or you know, spear shakers, these sorts of things. <laughs> spear shakers. Spear shakers. Because um, you know, I grew up in a very rural area, but you know, <laughs> these guys don't even know, know each I other. Was black, and that was really hard for me. I think. I, I think. Uh, now, did you ever want to like just bring your spear out and let them know that you were? Spear here's shaker? the thing. As, as, a, as a chimpanzee, you'd be okay with eating a fellow chimpanzee. Uh, yeah, it'd be fun. So one of the interesting things that happens is people can play more with their identities, right? So a, a black guy and a white guy can play with racism, <laughs> in essence, or this guy's playing a kid being a chimp, or I mean, everyone in some capacity was themselves, but they were also kind of performing. Like the two black guys who did the conspiracy theory thing, uh, the, the host owns the nightclub next door and is a good friend of mine. And they were playing this, like, the, the black conspiracy theorist <laughs> where everything, a cupcake, is, a, is, a, is about racism, you know. <laughs> and, um, and the way we structured that show was he said, uh, well, I want you to just, send, just put JPEGs, just images, up on the Internet, and we're going to make up racist sort of <laughs> responses to all of it. Like, everything can be a conspiracy. Um, so in some ways, it's also a really great, everyone's doing improv comedy. And I, we talked about this yesterday. The theory of improv comedy is that anything that is offered to you, you say yes to. And then you have a comma, and. So this theory of, it's collaboration, right? You know that when you collaborate well, you take someone's idea, and you, rather than no, but, you have to say yes, and. And that is a very powerful kind of tool that can happen with you know artists don't need that anyone can use that do you want to see more or should I should I go to something else hmm? just there's just a little bit more it's very funny some of it's serious too but wouldn't you rather have a banana oh but that, what if there's no bananas but there's always bananas dude uh -huh, it's yeah. the jungle oh I guess what about pineapples I don't think there's pineapples in the jungle. I think like pineapples like come from like Hawaii, and that's the only place they come from. That sucks. Oh yeah, I'm sure they do. That I was like some special guy uh, because like you know I'm gay and I'm black and like, but for the first time in my life I realized I'm not anybody, and I think it's awesome to not be anybody. I'm thinking of a thing called the crack shop. The crack shop? Yeah, it's actually we have a full service crack house <laughs> with a talk show inside. I think it's fabulous. I miss my biological. Okay, so um, I want to briefly, uh, because I think we don't have too much time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. So maybe I would, I would very briefly just show you the conflict kitchen. Um, and I'll start with this video actually, oops, sorry. <laughs> I think you'll like. Non c'è nessuno stato che si chiami Vecchia Zelanda. Valentina. A Pittsburgh ha aperto il Conflict Kitchen, un ristorante dove le coppie possono litigare liberamente. Vero o falso? Falso. Falso, falso. Esiste eh, questo Conflict Kitchen, ma di che si tratta Laura? <ride> esiste, esiste. Il Conflict Kitchen di Pittsburgh è un ristorante che prepara piatti provenienti soltanto da tutti quei paesi con cui gli Stati Uniti sono in conflitto. L'idea è di attirare i clienti con del buon cibo per poi coinvolgere in eventi o dibattiti mirati a stimolare proprio la conoscenza della cultura e della politica di alcuni stati come per esempio l'Iran, l'Iraq, Cuba, Venezuela e la Corea del Nord. Bene, grazie a Laura. Andiamo da Simona. So I don't think I could say it any better than Laura. <laughs> and I'm certainly not as beautiful as Laura. Carea <laughs> nota. Oh, Lord. 
So that's pretty much it. She actually really said it well. So the Conflict Kitchen opened I next to the waffle shop. You see it there to the right. And ooh, let me go through this. So here. Um, and the Conflict Kitchen only serves food from countries the U.S. is in conflict with. This is now going on its third year. Um, and we use food as a way of changing the discourse around politics and culture. Small city, we don't have a lot of ethnic diversity, so it, it basically, in a quick way, we now have, Pittsburgh has its first Persian restaurant ever, first Cuban restaurant ever, first Afghan restaurant ever, et cetera. So we've created the culture, what's it? German? German? <laughs> not, not yet. Close, <laughs> close. Um, so we've created the place we want to live in in Pittsburgh, right? We don't, it doesn't have political discussions. It seems provincial. Well, I don't want to be in a provincial city. I want to be in a city where I can talk about the things I'm passionate about with the public. So uh, what happens is we'll open, say, the Iranian version, and then after six months we close, and we reopen as the Afghan version. And then we close, and we open as the Venezuelan version. So it's five, six months each. Um, we work with local community who might be living in, in Pittsburgh. They help us develop the recipes. The food, this is the wrapper you're looking at, comes in with the interviews that we've done with people who are living in that country. Um, you know, folks eat while they read. And it's, you know, the opinions are contradictory. Again, it's about embracing ambiguity as opposed to a political ideology. And for United States, listen, I mean, I don't know if you've been there, but we're not the most thoughtful, self-reflexive country. And we're everywhere, politically and militarily. Um, and the, ch the opportunity here, before we went to war with Iraq, there was no public debate, right? We're about to go to war with Iran, maybe. There's other countries that we're already at war, overtly or covertly with. We need more public debate. I don't know what it's going to lead to, but we need it. So the food, again, is the seduction to get people to think about politics, culture, um, the staff are the performers. So our staff are very good at creating conversation, not being the experts, because I hate experts. You know, someone who just tells you this is the way it is, and it's more like, you know, what do you think? Have you been to Cuba? Are you following it? This is a couple of things. Pittsburgh. No, no, they're not from the country. They're just American. You know, I mean, some of them, occasionally some of them are. But the idea is that Culture belongs to everyone. And if we say, oh, we can only talk about, you know, Iran, if you're Iranian, that's the problem. Um, so Venezuela. So we went to Cuba recently to do research for the Cuban version. Our chef, who we now have, cooked the recipes with families, shopping, interviewing people, um, going to the North Korean embassy in Cuba. Uh, and then we open the Cuban version back in our city. We do events. This is, um, this is a live Skype meal between Pittsburgh and Iran. So we take our table, we put it up against the video projection screen, and they do the same thing in an art space in Iran. We all cook the same Persian recipes together. So we get, we get it wrong, probably. Ironically, we made it all from scratch, and they bought it out of cans. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this is in a space in Tehran and this is in Pittsburgh and here's another version in Pittsburgh and in Tehran in Pittsburgh so and in Tehran and then there's just a microphone that goes around and we talk back and forth it's just dinner, food, everyone you know food bypasses ideology um, same thing with usually food is, is, is related to this idea of conviviality, mm -hmm. we all are friends, we all are uh, all together. Oh. Yeah. Time, in this case, food is uh, like uh, just that. in order to speak about conflict. Mm -hmm. So it's also about tension, not just about being together and having a good time together. Yeah, and it's, you know, as a visual artist, a material that's hard to have is one that bypasses your intellect, that goes straight to your gut. You don't have to think about food. It's good or it's bad. So you just go right to, I want to eat this. It also engages people who would never come into a political rally or to an art project. I mean, the food creates diverse communities. 
And we, the, is, you know what the most important thing here is that the food is really good. We try to make amazing food. Uh, that's important because, oh, I mean, it's hard to have bad food. I mean, you can make it poorly, but if you make the recipes right, you get lots of people who will show up. Um, so we also have school groups who come. It's very much a pedagogical project in the city. Um, this billboard we use on top of the building. Uh, for a while, we just... Oh, so, okay, an economic strategy. So this project is uh, much more economically viable and sustainable. Number one, I don't have students working for me, which is good because it's, it's much more professionally done. Um, we have many more people come to eat. So we just moved recently and we have two, uh, on average, 200 people a day who come. Now it's a takeout restaurant, yeah. So uh, I don't know, you know, that's about $450,000 a year in revenue. It, much of it we just spend, but a lot of it we use for, you know, things that don't make us any money, performances and events. So it's now in its third year, it's become economically sustainable, which is important to us. Um, there was a, but there was a period in which we closed and I looked for a new location. I had nowhere to be. So in Cuba, they do something called a paladar. I don't know if you know about paladars, which are people run restaurants in their homes. And in Cuba, after the Soviets pulled out, there was no money to be had, the government. So people would open a little restaurant in their home, you know. Um, so we did that in my neighbor who lives across the street. We opened our restaurant in his house until we found another. We could have just said, oh, we can't find a place. We'll just stop. But it was like, what are the other strategies to exist in the, like a weed in society? Um, can ask whatever so um, yes please regarding like government and for example in this case the restaurant in your home what they, what uh, they no pay. one knows no, no one knows so it's not something in cuba they know but not in not, america but not in america it's illegal it's you will publicize because some, it's something that is, uh, is getting very popular around yeah well. it's illegal but yeah, that's eh, why I'm but then they close us and then that's then we'll do something else but they never closed us so this is our new location. It's in a public piazza, the main piazza in Pittsburgh. So now it's very busy. Um, we do, I'll show a couple, two quick events. One is called The Foreigner. And so you come to eat food and they say, would you like to eat with someone in Iran? Would you like to eat with Sorab? He's in Iran. And you're like, huh? And they, oh, you can eat with him through the body of Elise, who is here in Pittsburgh. She's, so... He said, go look for Elise. She's around the corner. And Elise is sitting there, and she has headphones on. And uh, let me see. She has headphones on, and she's connected live to Saurabh in Iran. Anything he says, she repeats. So she's a human avatar. And the customer has a microphone. And anything the customer says, Saurabh hears in Iran. So essentially, it's the idea of having a conversation with someone who's foreign, through the body of someone who's local. Um, and it's quite unusual, you know, I mean, people are sort of like, at first, like, well, you're a woman and there's a man that you're speaking for, so gender gets confused, ethnicity. Um, Now, this is a project I've done in another city. So you see on the left is the human avatar, and on the right is the uh, person from Iran that they're representing in different public spaces. Whoops. We did this at a museum that has a Persian art gallery of ancient Persian work. And when you walk in, you see this. You look for this African-American woman, and she is talking on behalf of uh, who, so Rob, my friend who runs an art gallery. So he's sitting in an art gallery in Iran of contemporary Iranian work. You're sitting in an art gallery in America of ancient Persian work. And he talks about the work in his gallery. So you kind of imagine two spaces at the same time and two people at the same time. This is the speech that we hire a Barack Obama to deliver that's written by Iranians. Ah, that's it. I don't think we need 
So we're opening a, a North Korean version next week in Pittsburgh. Always yeah. Well, Always in Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's a lot <laughs> of stuff. But are there maybe a little bit of time for que for some extra questions or? Yeah. Like uh, for for example, for me, all this. Um, all these events have created a space for communication between the public and the creator. I mean, I see your figure as a um, organizer. Some, yeah, kind of organizer, but that some something that gives a bridge of communication between the person that goes and look for it, mm -hmm. and specifically in the case of the waffle uh, shop. Mm -hmm. You say that you close it because well it was open for four years and right now it's well you get kind of uh, tired mm -hmm. it was the end of the project and for example all these people met for the first time in that in that place so according to you they will have the chance to to meet again in other places it's possible possibly but it's not something that you could create through the pass of, of the of the time I mean it's not it could be a goal. For, for what are you doing, or is not the main goal, mm. or... Yeah, the main goal isn't that they would then become friends and go off and meet each other. They could. I mean, sometimes it happens. But no, it's just for that moment to exist in which they do come together. Maybe a moment happens afterwards, but in which you can tell stories to someone and hear stories from someone that y you would never hear them from, that you would never create them with. Uh, so... It's sort of a simple goal, you know, just to make that moment exist in the public because it's we're all in our own little worlds, right? You walk through the piazza, it's this group and it's that group and it's this group. You go to the restaurant, it's these people at this table and those people at that table. Um, it's the same thing with that video where I move through everyone's homes. I, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in how things get mixed up and uh, sometimes it's just things adjacent to each other. And sometimes it's, I don't know, it's its very much like uh, chaos. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, like John, do you know the artist John Cage? I, I like his idea about just, he creates structures in which chaos can occur, certain type of chaos. And that chaos is the is the work. But it's not, he doesn't control it. He's not, he's sort of the author of the situation but he's not the author of the chaos yeah but that seems important the other thing is i think of everything being fiction so these are all true mu much of it is about true stories but um it's also about just creating a place where where we can play with all of these things where you can kind of construct truth together um, so I don't, I, I kind of think my, my interest is always a sort of, uh, a documentary. Like I think of these, all the works as kind of documentaries. I don't know what the subject <laughs> is sometimes, but I think, and they're not documentaries that I script. It's, they're sort of setting up the cameras or whatever for something to occur. That is a, a true story in the world that has some controls, but not. A lot. Yeah. Uh, the, the last three hours, you have always, uh, always very often said we. Can I ask right. you mostly yeah. and how do you end them? So we is different. So sometimes, like the Conflict Kitchen, I have an artist collaborator, Dawn Waleski. She and I, it's our project. We're the final directors of it. But we also have a chef who's very much a collaborator, but he has a responsibility we also have an assistant manager who oversees the staff then we also have a staff who you know have a certain responsibility and then we have the customers so that now where the waffle shop i would say that the we is very there's there i directed it but i did not create the content i mean that was just the public produced the content so it's a platform for them the the independent school of art was we in terms of me and the students came up with all the ideas together and then we all produced them together so there wasn't the pigeons it's 
me with idea, but museum and visitors, you know, are the participant collaborators in some way, but it's each one is a different kind of level of participation. It's why it's very difficult <laughs> when when I had to think of a project for Bologna and participation, like I don't often, you know, there was an award in Bologna that had artists make, come up with projects for um, participatory art. And I was like, oh, okay, what can people participate in? <laughs> and I think, I don't think that way usually. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And sometimes there's people say, oh, that's a good project because there was lots of participation. Maybe, maybe the lots of participation isn't interesting. Or maybe, you know, I, yeah, it's not a point. But I do work with lots of other artists as Usually when I work with an artist, they're, we're on the same level as collaborators. Um, and we come up with all the decisions together. And, and, but sometimes I work, like the, the people who raise pigeons, the pigeon club, they know, they're experts. So they tell me, you can't do this, you can't do that, but you might want to think about this. But in the end, it's not like the, when I work with an artist, because I'll make the final decision. I don't necessarily let them say, oh, you should have messages on the pigeons because they actually said, and I'm like, no, I don't want it to be like that. So I, so when I work with people who know more than I do, but uh, aren't equal collaborators, you know, they, but I tell them what their role is, you know, that's very clear. And to which extent uh, is the uh, presence necessary for the development of the project? And have you ever imagined like to Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, definitely. I mean, I left the Independent School of Art after two years, and the students took it over, but it slowly just died because there wasn't one person who cared about it all the time. That, to me, I mean, it's not about being like, it's about me. But it's about that one person needs to care all the time about everything. So in many of the projects, even though other people participate, I'm usually the one who cares. <laughs> so if, it's, if someone could take that role or several people, I actually don't think more than two people directing something should ever. It's always a catastrophe when I've worked with more than two people. Ugh, so bad. But I think if they felt like this is mine, yeah. yeah. It could happen, yeah. And there has been discussion, you know, oh, could you do a comfort kitchen here? <laughs> Maybe, if someone took it, you know, really took it, and then raised all the money. And yeah. Uh, again, the comfort kitchen started off of the waffle shop, which already had an economic, so it was for free to start it. Now, then it had built an audience, and then we moved it, and it now generates itself. We get grants occasionally to kind of help, but we don't actually need them. We're at a point where, yeah, it's, it's liberating. Oh, to not have to ask for money, to not have to write a grant you don't really want, and do some things you don't really want to do, to get the money so you can do what you want to do. <sighs> That's... Yeah, but that's rare. I mean, uh, you know, I've this sells food, so it makes money. Obviously, there's ideas that don't do that. Um, you know, you can't always make money from it. But it's an interest for me. It's been interesting to think about that. And now I'm an employer. I have employees who, this is their job. This is how they make a. L so I have 14 people working for me, which has changed the way. Like we're like, oh, if we do Cor North Korea. Are people going to buy food from a North Korean restaurant? I have to think about this. So we didn't, we realized we needed to build customers who love our food and trust us. And then we can open North Korean restaurant and people would still come and not be afraid because if they were afraid and they don't come, we don't make money and then I have to fire people, which I don't want to do. You know, so that's a responsibility and <laughs> I've never had in an art project, but I value you know, the capacity to be able to give people 
an income. The challenge is to not have to make decisions that are just economic. And a family. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean this. I've been away this whole week. Yeah. Even my chef has been away. We were in France together. Yeah, it's, it's the people who run it are great. They're amazing. Yeah, I don't have to be there all the time. In the beginning, yes. Now it's easier. I mean, I do. I'm constantly <laughs> working and communicating. It's not like I totally get to leave, but. Yeah, it's also I get bored very quickly, so being able to teach and make works in different places is is good. Ideally, I mean I like to I it's funny, I talk about when I go to another country and make a work, it's like candy. It's fun, it's quick, it's exciting, you get immediate feedback, you're in another country, everything's new and interesting. But with candy, it's like you get sleepy and tired and <laughs> And these are more like protein, you know. It's not quite as fun or as quickly, but it keeps me, yeah, it keeps you alive. It feels like you, yeah, it feels much more uh, important to me. And uh, I think in some ways, I mean, I still like to go to other places and do things, but in some ways my dream is to just stay home. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. And in here it's just the restaurant. It's in here in this project, this the, the the world, the art project is the restaurant, the food all together. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's what the project is. I mean, I do. Yeah. And many people don't think it's art. Yeah. Well, we were. I was telling Gabriela like. And what the criti criticizers, I, I don't know what's the name critics. of Critics. Critics, there we go. <laughs> I was looking yeah. What the critics will say. The art critics? Yes, of course. Yeah, <laughs> Who cares? <the> <laughs> I really, I don't care. You don't care? No, I don't. Well, my... I mean, I kind of care what anyone says. You know, I care when people don't like the food or think that... I do, I care. I mean, that's. I can't say I don't care about criticism. But it's not art criticism is more valuable than other criticism. Um, although I think of it as art, and I mean I'm I th I'm interested in it in relationship to how artists have worked historically and are working today. But um, if you look at the media for the project, it is mostly um, you know, whoops. I mean Al Jazeera came and filmed the project. To me, no critic could say anything that would be more interesting than Al Jazeera deciding to come and do a news show about it on Arabic language. That's, I mean, you know, yeah, Arabic language, it's, it's United States based, but they send it out to the Arabic language. No, it was Iranian at the time, yeah. So, or, you know, it's, uh, the BBC or, you know, La Repubblica, The Independent, like these are, or it's food, places that love food <laughs> or business or social entrepreneurship. Um, so there's ways in which people enter and know about the project that is not through art. Most people. I mean, La Aridata, what is it? The, the TV show, the Italian TV show? La Arid Legacy. I don't, they don't care that it's hard, <laughs> right? So, but what happens is it seems weird, but many people because of that show in Italy, like all of a sudden our Twitter was going crazy with all Italians like, oh, you need to check out our website, which is very dense and you can get a greater sense of the project. Um, so that is so much more fascinating that you could enter through food because you love food or politics or culture or just, I don't know, it's weird, um, or art. Art, our customers don't care about art. They think art cares about you. <laughs> <laughs> they think art cares about me? Yeah, sure. Maybe. Maybe. I think many of them think like, 
how could you you're a professor in art this is an art project it's nice we like it yeah yeah there's a you know a realm of the art world of artists who work like i do you know and for them it's they're, they're interested in the critics and the histories and it's okay yeah yeah the sense of food like yeah like a connect a, a connector uh, in a way can 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 be so lovable food to mm -hmm. reflect about politics in a way that okay i can okay. put something i can hit something and reflect about politics but if in the same place there was uh, for example an exhibition with photos and video mm -hmm. maybe there's not mm, the same number of people you know no. And it's interesting, the stronger of uh, the food in this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, <coughs> yeah. The food to me is that river. Mm. Everyone eats, <laughs> everyone. And how can I take a little bit of that or put a filter in that river, divert it? It's already powerful. I mean, I'm interested in placing myself where power already exists rather than trying to make art in a vacuum and hope that i mean there's a power to art i guess but yeah food so it's so dumb too it's just like it's food um, ah, and this it's very important yeah so w i work with a graphic designer your designer right uh brett yasko who's an amazing he lives in pittsburgh he's amazing and it's super important. It's so seductive. It tells a story. If the graphic were not as much Definitely. In the I as they are. Yeah. I don't think that we would be in all the uh, online media stuff. I think newspapers, and they love the way it looks in their magazine. They love the way it looks in their magazine. They and they like our previous location more because it was so graphic. So that's important. You know, so now we're in all these magazines because they l it tells a story graphically very quickly. And yeah, I think that's super important. I mean, I'm still a visual artist. I still think about, you know, the how that moves. Um, and we, so that's the other realm. The designers are very interested in the project because designers are really interested in how design can have a social function, not just a commercial function. So we talk a lot to, to different design groups about how we do it. But I come from, like, I don't, to be honest, I'm the worst cook. I love to eat, but I'm just awful. And so I don't, I'm not like a foodie, and I'm not a designer, and I'm not many. Of the, so I come from a kind of sideways position. It's sort of like the the artists I like who work with technology, you know, like really interesting technological stuff the best ones are the ones who like don't care about technology you know they're just sort of like using it it's just a tool um and designers too i mean i think you know you don't have to come from the look of something it could be the also the graphics tells are about the choice and mm -hmm. communicate something for instance i was thinking about the project i think it's thomas hisham did in new york mm -hmm. he did the grand Shipar. Uh, that summer. Yeah, yeah. Um, he had this very handmade graphics, like yeah. He didn't curate the whole, but I think it was intentional. Yeah. So I mean, the I think I'm not really into art, so mm -hmm. maybe I can, I may be wrong, but uh, I think it's it's just uh, the way he chose to have this kind of unintentional and um, casual. Uh, Casual graphics. Also, yeah. the website is a very old school because it yeah. has the red and the green text, <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. very Windows yeah. 95. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you see this beautiful curate. Do you think this um, graphical choice are important as well um, as the uh, content? Yeah. yeah. The content? I mean, I think he's doing an anti-design 
graphic or a amateur design? You, do you know Thomas Hirshhorn, the artist Thomas Hirshhorn? Large installations built around usually like a philosopher and it's made with like tape and cardboard and m markers and complicated projects. But he uses a real like, like almost like he's homeless, <laughs> you know, and he's just writing things out. But that communicates something very clearly. Um, I mean, in some ways, this is very like fancy design. This style, but mm -hmm. it's a style itself. It's not like I don't have any means; I cannot do anything. True. No, very <laughs> conscious style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We choose a style that's like vivid, and also we want it to be shocking in public. Like we want it to stand out and shout like a megaphone. Uh, and you know, in most of the, t the like the Farsi or the Spanish, the the language is not um, English, so just have like this non English. You know, the the facade, the Korean facade is all. You know, it's important that it's just <laughs> it's all Korean, so you feel like you're in the wrong place <laughs> a bit. Um, so yeah, so those are kind of the the graphic decisions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.